On Wednesday afternoon, I uh, got a call saying the air conditioner repair crew could come to my house uh, and they could be there in 20 minutes. So, you know, I dropped everything here, got in my car because otherwise they said it was going to be next week. And um, I shouldn't complain because it was for the first time in 12 years that I've had, had anything done to my heating or air conditioning. So no complaints there. But I got home and I was looking out my, my back window, um, kind of talking to the guys through the open window who were working in the back on the air conditioning. And I saw that in the field that's kind of between my house and the river, the North Skunk River, I saw my grandsons out there replanting corn. The, the Thursday before Memorial Day, there was at least 12 inches of water over that entire field, and the corn had already been planted, so it had to be replanted. And they'd prepared the ground. That, that bottom dries out really quickly. It floods quick, but it dries out quick. So they were trying to replant the corn, and I know their dad had, you know, given them instructions. They'd done it with him many times. But I was, I was just filled with pride because those guys were out there doing that. And I was filled also with pride for my son-in-law, Tony, who trusted them to go and do that. And that trust implies room to make mistakes. Room to fail. Now, I, I have great grandkids, and, and you'll find out some of the reason why, because their, their mother prepared all my children to uh, be great parents. I don't take any credit for that. But the, the reality of it is, is that um, I've watched, I've watched, especially those four boys, because I only live five miles away from where I live, I've watched them grow up in an atmosphere where they had permission to fail, where there was not an expectation that they would be perfect. And do you, you have any idea how important that is? Do you have any idea how important that is? You see, there, there is a sense in which followers of Jesus, and if you're not a follower of Jesus this morning, Great, there's not a better message for you to listen to today because you're going to get kind of an insider's view of how we deal with our own imperfections, or at least how we should deal with our own imperfections. Not saying we do it right all the time. I certainly don't. But there, there's this expectation on the part of followers of Jesus that somehow God expects me to be perfect, that he expects me to be sinless, and we, we confuse terminology and, and we allow Satan to deceive us into thinking somehow that if we mess up, oh, we've messed everything up, we, we, are, we might as well go, go all the way back to go and not collect $200 and, and just you know, start all over. But that's not the message of the gospel. That's not the message of the New Testament. That's not what Jesus taught us. And that's not what his disciples want us to know about our relationship with Jesus and what he expects from us. The writer of Hebrews, and, and I know some of you have mentioned to me in the last few weeks as I've uh, talked about Hebrews uh, chapter 12. You said, Jim, sometimes you say Paul. And I admit that I have a bias. I think either Paul wrote the letter to the Hebrews or that maybe Luke was sitting with him uh, in prison when the letter was written and Luke did it. Uh, we don't know who the author is, but it has a lot of language in it and a lot of structure that makes us think it was either Paul or someone highly influenced by Paul, which might be Luke. So that's kind of an aside. So I recognize that sometimes I say Paul instead of the writer of Hebrews. Um, that's my bias. Uh, the, the writer of Hebrews has challenged us to be in this race, to keep our eyes on Jesus, to function as followers of Jesus in such a way that, that we're pursuing Jesus. And he comes to a, a point 
in what we call chapter 12. There weren't any chapter headings when this letter was originally written. But he, he makes this statement. And this statement is, is leading up to a very important point. He says, make every effort to live in peace with everyone. Wow. I, I watch the news. I, I love watching the news. I watch two or three different news broadcasts. Uh, I do not like when news organizations put people on there to give me their opinion. I just want to hear what the news is. And I, I read um, several online publications daily because I, I like to know what's going on. I'm especially, I especially follow what's going on on the continent of Africa because whether you know it or not, there are more Christians on the continent of Africa than here. You, th you think that, I mean, we grew up with this illusion and we have this illusion in the church that somehow America is a Christian nation. No, there's some, there some countries in Africa that have a far higher rate of Christians in them than we do. So I follow Africa. I want to know what's going on in Africa. And I think it's fascinating to see what is taking place there. The writer of Hebrews says, make every effort to live at peace with everyone, and yet we live in a world that is not at peace, that, that is at war. People are, are, are at war with each other. Um, and and it, it's just to the place where it affects every one of us in one way or the other because of the conflict that goes on. And the writer of Hebrews says, look, make every effort to live at peace with everyone and to be holy. And to be holy. And to be holy. Now, I'll, can I point out something? It does not say be perfect. It says be holy. Holiness is not perfection. I'm going to say it again. Holiness is is not perfection. Holiness is not perfection. Holiness is being different. It's being set apart. It's being consecrated. It doesn't have any implication in it that we are to be perfect. Just that we are to be set apart. We're to be different. Listen, if, if you claim to be a follower of Jesus, and you're not different from everybody else around you, Something's wrong. You need to do a heart check. You need to do a relationship check. If your language, if your behavior is the same as everybody else who is not a Jesus follower, you have a challenge. Because holiness means that we are set apart, that we're different that we're consecrated, that, that we have taken on a, a new structure. Paul says that, we, that when we follow Jesus, we become a new creation. And that means there's something different about us because we're a follower of Jesus. That's something that we have to really evaluate in our own lives. If we watch the same thing on TV that everybody else watches, if we're watching the same crap on TikTok that everybody else watches, if we're engaging in the behavior that, that people engage in uh, who aren't followers of Jesus, then what claim do we have? What right do we have? What possibility do we have of saying that I'm a follower of Jesus? Oh, I prayed a prayer when I was a little kid. No, 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 no. Come on. When you were a little kid, that got you hell insurance. When you're an adult, when you're an adult, you're, you're called to live differently as a follower of Jesus. Jesus' disciples were not like any other disciples. There were a lot of rabbis who had disciples when Jesus walked the earth. And Jesus' disciples were different than all of them. I mean, goodness, the Pharisees picked, them all, picked on them all the time. You know, Rabbi, why are you letting your disciples go over there and help themselves to the grain in the field? It's a Sabbath. 
They're not supposed to be doing this. Rabbi, why did you let those disciples bring someone to you on the Sabbath to be healed? That's work. You shouldn't be doing that. And, and Jesus said, no, this is different. This is different. I'm not here to be like everybody else. Your relationship with Jesus is not, is not a call or a permission for you to be like everybody else, except you go to church, and when a swear word slips and the pastor's around, you say, oh, sorry, pastor. And I usually say, well, it's not my name you took in vain. Don't apologize to me. I mean, there, there's, there's a sense in which we, we're called to be holy. We're called to be set apart. And why? Because without holiness, without being set apart, no one will see the Lord. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And this isn't a threat. This isn't a threat at all. This is not, you know, the writer of Hebrews saying that God is, is this judge, and if you screw up once, he's going to bring the hammer of justice down on your head, and that's it, you're done. That's not what this is at all. Because remember, holy is not perfect. Holy is not perfect. No, it's being set apart. Without being set apart, without being different, without being consecrated before God, you're not going to see God. And the writer of Hebrews goes on, and he puts even more responsibility on us as followers. He says, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God. Hey, can you just stop and think about that phrase for a moment? God's grace is available to everybody. God's grace is available to everybody. And what is grace? It's when we get something we don't deserve. That's what grace is. And God's grace is available to everybody. God wants us to live in his grace, especially those of us who follow Jesus. But one of the ways he reveals himself to people who are not following Jesus yet is by being gracious to them. And in spite of their behavior, he still allows them to come to him and to confess and ask him to be their Lord and their master, their king, their boss, and the conductor of their lives. You see, we, we forget how important God's grace is, mainly because we're still stuck on this whole idea that we're trying to be perfect because we've confused holiness with perfection and sinlessness. But that's not what it is. So the, the writer of Hebrews says, make sure that everybody around you sees and understands and grasps God's grace at work in your life so that they also will experience God's grace in their lives. And there's another reason too, because if, this, if we don't exhibit, if we don't become the illustration of God's grace in our lives and what God's grace can do for somebody else's life, then they grow up with a root of bitterness and it causes trouble, and it defiles a lot of people. And, and you know, you already know people who have rejected God, who have rejected Jesus, who have rejected the, the, the church, not as an institution, but as a gathering of God's people, the fellowship of God's people, the household of faith. They've rejected those things, because, boy, the church did something. They treated my mom bad when she was a single mother. Or they, they said this to me. Or some snide remark was made here. Uh, or I was ostracized because of this. The list goes on and on and on and on. And the bitterness grows. And they reject God. They reject the message of Jesus. They reject Jesus himself. And what happens when that happens, when that takes place is that people get defiled. What does defile mean? It means they, they begin to live in a sin instead of living in grace, instead of experiencing forgiveness, instead of recognizing God's mercy. 
But he doesn't stop with the root of bitterness. He doesn't stop with that. He goes on and he says, See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau. Oh, got to stop there for a minute. What? Was, was Esau godless and sexually immoral? No, that's not the story of Esau. The story of Esau is that he was mastered by his desire for instant gratification. Remember the story where he came back from hunting and he was hungry? And he said to his brother, give me that bowl of, of stew. And he sold his birthright to his brother for a bowl of stew. He sold the blessing of the firstborn son for a bowl of stew. And Jacob, the secondborn, got the blessing instead of Esau. Now that was deceptive. It was wrong. I mean, don't, don't think that God had to have that happen. We could just as easily be the people of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau as we are the people of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Just remember that. God didn't need Jacob and his mother to sin and deceive Esau. He didn't need that to happen. He allowed it to happen. And he allows things to happen in your life. And, and, and he, the writer of Hebrews says, don't forget what happened to Esau. He let something master him. So can we go back and look at the beginning of this verse? Nothing should be a master in our lives except Jesus. If we let anything master our lives except Jesus, then he is no longer our Lord. He's no longer the king of our life. If we let the money, the pursuit of money, uh, if we let lust, sexual immorality, be our master, if we let our, our desire to promote ourselves and be full of pride, there are so many masters in our lives. So many. And we, we fall for it so easily because Satan, you know, Satan has never come forward to anyone in all of history and he's never come forward to you and asked you to declare him to be the Lord of your life. He's, he, that's not his style. He deceives you by saying, hey, you know, you're in charge of you. You do what you want. Follow your heart. One of Satan's greatest lies in our culture. Follow your heart. Don't follow your heart, please. Follow Jesus. Don't let anything become your master. Esau let his own pride and hunger become his master. And for, the, for a single bowl of stew, he sold his birthright. He sold the right of being the firstborn son. Now, when, when we talk about this, we have to be very careful that we understand all the implications, okay? Because when it says that, that we're to see to it that nobody uh, misses the grace of God, that nobody falls into sexual immorality, that, that nobody master, lets something else master their lives, it doesn't mean that you and I have that responsibility to convict them of their sin, Conviction is the responsibility of the Holy Spirit. C can you hear me say that again, please? Listen, listen. Conviction is the responsibility of the Holy Spirit. It's not your job, and it's not my job. Conviction is the responsibility of the Holy Spirit. This is what James says. The brother of Jesus, this is what he writes. He says, Next slide, please. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover a multitude of sins. Conviction, my friends, is the responsibility of the Holy Spirit. Our responsibility? Our responsibility is to pray fervently, to love generously, patiently and graciously. 
our job is not to go up to somebody who is caught in a in the trap of sin and grab them by their collar and shake them and say, you better repent or you're going to hell. That's that's not my job and that's not your job. Our responsibility is to put actually put our arm around that person and say, do you know that I really care about you? Do you know that Jesus loves you no matter what? Do you know that there's nothing you could ever do that would make God love you any less than he loves you right now? Do you know that? That's our responsibility with those people. To be gracious with them. To pray for them. To be patient with them. To share our story with them. But it's not my responsibility and it's not your responsibility to convict them. As someone said to me one time when I was younger and I was all concerned about a certain situation... This guy looked at me and said, Jim, you're not the Savior in this situation. He said, there's only one Savior, and it's not you. Thank God, he said. Yeah, right. I'm not the Savior. You're not the Savior. We have to let the Holy Spirit do his job, but then we have to listen and respond to Jesus and do what Jesus asks us to do, which is to love our neighbor and love each other the way Jesus loves us. Sacrificially, generously, graciously. That's the way Jesus loves us. And when when we grasp that, Our response should be worship. Our response should be worship. Because God, God in his mercy and wisdom, did not give you and me the responsibility to convert everybody. He said, no, love everybody. Be patient with them. Accept them without affirming their behavior. I, we've talked about this before. I've already got a question for our, our question series where we're going to talk about it again. But my friends, it is possible to accept someone without affirming their behavior. And I know, I know that media message and the cultural message that our society says, well, if I accept you, I have to accept and affirm all your behavior. Not true. Not true. That's a lie. That's another lie from Satan. And he's being very, very successful at promoting that lie in our culture. And in your heart. Because that, that, that is absolutely a lie. Jesus proved it. When he went and he met with the Samaritan woman at the well. And if you read that account, if you read that story... Not once did he ever affirm her behavior, but he accepted her. He accepted her. And he didn't affirm her behavior. And you know what? The woman at the well in Samaria became the first evangelist in the entire New Testament. Because she went back to her village and says, hey, you got to come and hear this guy. you got to come and see. He must, he must be the Messiah. And she gathered everybody that would listen to her from her village, and they all came out to the well to meet with Jesus and listen to Jesus and hear from Jesus. She was the first evangelist. And she didn't go into town to convert everybody or convict everybody of their sin. She told her story. She says, man, this guy guy told me everything about myself, stuff that no one else would know. And there's a, a sense in which You and I are called to pray fervently, to love generously, to be gracious and patient with the people around us that don't yet know Jesus. And part of the way we do that is the way we recognize Jesus' death and resurrection. This is is what the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Corinth about their worship celebration of Jesus' death and resurrection. He says this. He says, The Lord, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
And, and then in the same way, he took the cup after supper and, and he said this. He said, this cup is the new covenant. And we got to stop there, folks. Uh, I, I had again a conversation this week from, with someone who was so concerned about um, the, the law, the law of Moses. And they were, they were concerned that, that somehow we had to show people that there were Ten Commandments and that if you didn't keep those Ten Commandments, that your eternity was in question. And, and again, I want to say to you, holiness is not perfection. Holiness is not keeping the law. Holiness is being set apart, being consecrated, being different. Jesus came and he established what? A new covenant. We're not, we don't live under Abraham's covenant anymore. We don't live under the covenant that he explained to the people through Moses after they came out of Egypt. We don't live under that covenant anymore. That covenant got replaced by a new covenant. I'm so glad that I don't have to go out and find a sheep or a turtle dove or a grain offering to bring to God to get forgiveness of my sin. Aren't you glad that you don't have to do that? So why, why then, why then do we keep defaulting back to the old covenant? When Jesus established a new covenant, he says this, this cup, this, this juice that we're going to have in just a minute, this juice is the new covenant. And when you do this, remember me. Remember me. Danelle's going to come up and, and play on the piano so there's some music. But, and we're going to come forward. I'm going to invite you to come forward and, and get a cup that has a, a little cracker on the bottom and juice on the top. If you're gluten-free, there's gluten-free crackers uh, in the back on the rail and on the sound booth. So go get that. But I, I want you to not do this in silence. Okay? Danelle's going to be playing the piano to give us some, some piano music. Uh, a lot of that's for the people online because I, I want you to talk with each other. I want you to tell each other while you're coming up here why this is important to you. You know, it may be something as, as simple of Man, I just need to be reminded that Jesus died for me. It may be more complex. Wow, this week God has, God has cleansed me from sin. And I, I'm, just, I'm doing this because I recognize that I have recent sin that has been taken away because of this new covenant. Because Jesus died. Whatever it is, I, I, don't, don't come up here and be silent, okay? Okay? But I, I want you to, to come, you're going to start and just move to the middle, come up here, get a cup, and then go back down the sides. That's the most efficient way to do this. And, and I'm inviting you to do this to worship, to celebrate, to remember. Heavenly Father, just as Jesus did, we give thanks for the bread and thanks for the cup because we know what it represents we have this incredible privilege of living on this side of the cross. When the disciples heard these words for the first time, I'm sure they were bewildered and confused. But there is no confusion for us. Because we know. We know with history and assurance. We know not because the Bible says, but because history says that you died on a cross. That you shed your blood that your body, your bones were broken, and that the grave couldn't hold you. So now, Lord, help us to grasp the depth of the meaning and worship you as we take this bread and this cup together. Amen. So the bottom cup has a little cracker in the bottom. Again, if you're gluten-free, there's, there's that on the the rail back there but my friends listen listen to me hear this this represents Christ's body which was broken for you 
He gave himself. He established the new covenant so that you and I don't have to go and do animal sacrifices anymore. He established a new covenant. And this is part of it. So take and eat and remember. And the juice... The juice represents his blood. And for those of you who have been in church, you know that in the Old Testament, blood had a cleansing and covering meaning. We were cleansed by the blood that was shed on the altars. We were covered our sins were covered by the blood when they sacrificed those animals. And Jesus did that once and for all. No animal, no person ever has to die again in order for someone to receive forgiveness for their sin because Jesus did it. He took care of it. Praise be to God. Take, drink, and remember. We're going to sing a song. Um, the worship team's going to come up and lead us in a song. And, and the lyrics of this song remind us of what we just did. Because the, one of the recurring phrases in this song, we're going to put it on the screen, is, I've nothing else fit for a king except for a heart singing hallelujah. Uh, you've heard me say this before. Yesterday afternoon, I was in the office. I was talking through this message out loud. I was praying through this message. I listened to the songs that we're going to sing. Some of them multiple times. This is one that was repeated I don't know how many times. Because I kept thinking about what God's broken body, what Jesus' broken body and shed blood have meant for me. Just for me. And the only, the only response is to sing hallelujah. You can't sing, say it. Okay? But the only response is hallelujah. 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 Let's stand and sing together.